Your technology yeah. is Galen on Joy. Oh, good to see you, George. Yeah, I'm yeah. awesome. Thanks for your work. Yeah, I'm sure, and I'm late coming in. Okay, well, we're, we've only done on one topic so far, so, which is community activation. We've got those two on the board over here. Wonderful. Round everybody up really quick. All right. All right, thank you so much for that break. Um, we have two full pages, which is amazing. Vivian, can you read one or two things from the infrastructure justice side? Yeah. Okay, infrastructure justice, only two or three? Connections to neighboring communities, crosswalks more on St. James and at night. Yep. And flash and beacon lights. Maybe a potluck dinner in each neighborhood. I like that. Ask residents there what infrastructure elements need to be fixed and prioritize those needs and they do what they say. Well, it sounds like, there's a lot of, sounds like there's a lot of outreach from what you read there, a lot of getting feedback from the communities that probably are the ones who are going to be benefiting or might need it the most. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a good, a good takeaway. And just for everybody, we'll type these up and share them with everybody with each bucket so that these are all communal. Um, but yeah, I like that. That's probably the justice aspect of getting out to where people are. Um, can I get a, a volunteer to read one or two things in the community activation slide over there? Sure. Uh, Talk to the users, go to the bus stops, not just uh, professional meeting goers. Uh, community, uh, deep community engagement. Make it easier for local community led groups to address what they see as issues in which they feel their concerns are being ignored. Mm. Uh, create a how to Which guide for uh, Complete Streets Demo Day. Um, Interpretive and transi uh, translation to ensure non-English speakers in are involved and are included. Uh, recognize that not all communities will have the time and resources to advocate for those things on their own, which I think is the reason why we're all here today. <laughs> <laughs> Great recap. Um, excellent. I thank you all for your participation. This was just one of the three that we're going to do today. So. Keep in mind that we want your voices heard. Um, obviously, speak up if we have the, the Q and A's and in between, but we'll have opportunities to throw more pieces of paper on the wall for us. Um, in the interest of keeping this show moving, um, I'm gonna introduce Pete Sutton here. He is the statewide bicycle and advise, uh, bicycle and pedestrian coordinator uh, at MassDOT. I know Pete very well. He also plays a mean bass line. Uh -huh. um, get the opportunity to catch him in his act. Um, but yeah, but Pete's been um, a great ally to the biking and walking movement. Um, we have some fantastic allies at DOT. I do want to just give a special thanks to the DOT for participating in these summits. We had right down there. Uh, awesome. we had Pete today, we had Michelle Danilla yesterday in Salem, and Tom Pagapalo out in Worcester on Tuesday. And um, Laura. Laura. From the district? Yeah, nice. <laughs> I was I was I was gonna give Laura a shout I out will, too. <laughs> Betsy jumped in a little bit, so I'll, I'll yeah. definitely let Pete steal the show in a second. But I definitely want to say thanks because um, we are getting a lot of support from the folks at DOT, and um, you'll hear all about that with Pete's presentation here. Thanks. Just take uh, it away. Is the do I just? Uh, I think you just press buttons and it should work. Okay. Great. Can everybody see this, or should I dim the lights a little bit? No, it's okay. In the back, you're okay. You can, all right, well anyway, good morning everybody. Uh, morning. Like uh, Galen morning. said, I'm Pete Sutton and uh, uh, I work within MassDOT's Office of Transportation Planning in Boston. Happy to be here today. Um, I always feel very at home here just because this is where I'm from. I grew up across the river in Agawam. I went to high school right up the street in Cathedral High. I spent many an hour in this very library before the internet was invented. When you had to do research, this is where you came. Uh, I also worked across the street at the Springfield Civic Center, putting my uh, way through high school and college. Uh, sold a lot of ice cream and popcorn at Springfield Indians hockey games back in the day. So, uh, uh, it, and it's, I, I still have family here. I'm gonna be staying with them actually in Westfield tonight. Uh, always great to come back here, especially these days, because I have a very unique perspective being the bicycle and pedestrian coordinator for MassDOT. Uh, just in the past five uh, years or so, the amount of biking and walking infrastructure that we've added out here has been uh, quite remarkable. And uh, 
you know, that, that's how I kind of view uh, through that lens every time I come back and visit. Um, there's always new infrastructure being added. Uh, I uh, can't take credit for it. That is on the part of the districts, actually. And I want to give a shout out to our District 2 Bicycle and Pedestrian Coordinator, Laura Hansen here, uh, who's with us today. Laura, hey, thanks. Laura. <laughs> Laura, Laura has a projects list of all bicycle and pedestrian related uh, stuff that if you want to hit her up uh, during lunch, uh, she'll be happy to give you some updates on. I know that we just put out to bid last week uh, the project in downtown Westfield for the Columbia Greenway where we're going to be putting five brand new bridges reconstructed there. Uh, we also just opened during Bay State Bike Week two new pieces. Uh, one, uh, the official ribbon cutting over the Westfield River for the Columbia Greenway. It's a beautiful bridge. And also, uh, my personal new favorite piece of uh, biking infrastructure out here is in West Springfield, the new stretch of the Connecticut yeah. River Walk and Bikeway, which if you have not been out there yet, is amazing. You have not seen the Connecticut River in this perspective before. The, we basically opened up this brand new view to it that had never existed before. And even though it's only a mile and a half long, it's probably better for a walk than a bike ride, but um, you know, if you look at Jeff's map in the background, there's a lot of planned connections on both sides of the Connecticut River, uh, both MassDOT projects and local projects too. So there is a lot going on uh, in, in this area, uh, which I'm very excited about. Uh, one of the things that I've been overseeing for the past couple of years that a lot of you have uh, weighed in on, sent comments uh, uh, both online and in public are the uh, statewide bicycle and pedestrian transportation plans. Uh, the pedestrian transportation plan um, has, uh, hadn't been updated uh, in 20 years. Last one was in 1998. Mm. The last time the bicycle plan was updated was 10 years ago in 2008. So think of all the things that have happened, uh, especially the rise in cycling as a viable means of transportation and recreation. I was looking back in the 2008 bike plan and I think Bike lanes got maybe one paragraph. I think complete streets was mentioned once or twice. And now they're kind of the cornerstones of every uh, bike plan that is out there. And uh, this is no exception. Um, so I'm going to give an overview today of the statewide bike plan, uh, <clears throat> which features demand analysis, project prioritization, and selection. I know very wonky terms, but we are relying heavily on data uh, to make our decisions about which kind of bicycle projects uh, and infrastructure we want to put in all around the state. Uh, I'll uh, preface that by saying that the uh, crux of this plan is mostly to build uh, bike infrastructure on MassDOT roads in particular, but we also want to uh, help fund our municipal partners too because uh, some of you may know or may not know that MassDOT controls actually very little of the roadways throughout the entire state. It's less than 20%. And most of those roadways are interstate highways, bridges, and tunnels. Uh, the rest of it is under municipal jurisdiction. So very important that we get uh, the word out and uh, the assistance out to our municipal partners. And uh, I'm seeing just in the first two talks today that that is definitely happening with the complete streets work uh, one and safe routes to school. Two big successful projects that are also uh, included in these plans. So, the vision of the bike plan, fairly simple. Biking in Massachusetts will be a safe, comfortable, and convenient option for everyday travel. Pretty straightforward. Um, like I said, the last time we updated it was uh, 10 years ago, so it was definitely due. We spent the past two years planning uh, the process. Uh, this plan, as well as the pedestrian plan, are, are quite uh, uh, special in the fact that there is finally some real money attached to them. $60 million in uh, the capital investment plan over the next five years uh, for high pro priority projects that are spun out of both bike and pedestrian plans. And uh, we have also, uh, because our relationships with the municipalities are so important, we put out companion documents to both plans, the Municipal Resource Guide for Walkability and Bikeability. And you can view all of these plans online. Uh, the the uh, bike and ped plans are in draft form, but they're about to be finalized within the next couple weeks or so. Just go to the mass.gov uh, mass website and type in bicycle plan or pedestrian plan or Municipal Resource Guide for Walkability or Bikeability, and you can see all four of them. Um, 
So the whole planning process, like I said, uh, revolved around data, it revolved around public engagement, uh, which was both in person and online. Uh, we uh, had a great consultant with Tool Design Group that has offices internationally, uh, not only offices in Chicago and Seattle, but also in Toronto. They were reviewing and incorporating nationwide and international best practices, seeing if they could be incorporated at the state level here in Massachusetts. And we also had a steering committee uh, of the Massachusetts Bicycle and Pedestrian Advisory Board in which Jeff McCullough, who is uh, going to be presenting soon as a, a long-standing member, and we appreciated that input. Uh, so the vision, uh, the goals, main goals, eliminate bicycle fatalities and serious injuries and increase the percentage of everyday trips made by bicycling. Uh, Unlike the last bicycle plan, which focused on a 750 mile network called the Bay State Greenway, it was a great idea, but it was gonna take 25 to 30 years to build out. We decided to do a complete 180 on this bike plan and really focus on everyday bikeable trips of three miles or less that uh, most normal people can make mm -hmm. in areas to uh, get people out of their cars, basically, whenever possible and, uh, you know, uh, uh, get some exercise. I mean, I walk the walk and talk the talk. Where I live in Somerville, uh, I commute every day by bike to my office in downtown Boston by Park Plaza. It's five miles each way and I'm very fortunate uh, to be able to bike and uh, I do it for the three reasons because it's definitely the fastest way. It's mm -hmm. 25 minutes uh, door to door regardless of season whether it's five degrees or 95 degrees. Uh, it's also free, it doesn't cost me anything and it's great exercise and it puts me in a great frame of mind. Whenever I ride into work on my bike, I never show up in a bad mood. So um, yeah. a lot of those things are trying to be factored into the bike plan as well. Um, principles value people bicycling and their travel needs, especially the most vulnerable, to ensure they can bicycle safely. We want to treat all modes of travel at MassDOT as equally as we can. If you've ever heard our secretary Stephanie Pollock talk, she's always talking about giving people options. She knows that a lot of people have to drive, but it's great for the people that don't have to, if they could walk, if they could bicycle, if they could take public transit. We need to step up on all of those initiatives as well. And she is well behind this plan. We're actually going to be doing a public launch uh, in a couple of weeks, I think in Natick, at the groundbreaking for the Kachichuit Rail Trail, where she's going to formally uh, launch the final plans and maybe uh, announce a few more projects that we're about to prioritize. Uh, the third principle, uh, again, goes back to the municipalities, lead the Commonwealth, leading the goals by supporting municipalities and other agencies to advance everyday biking. These are all the initiatives. They're around uh, uh, building safe, comfortable bicycle networks, providing uh, local, regional, state partners with the tools they need, increasing roadway safety, always because we all know that people won't ride if they don't feel safe, increase access to bicycles and the convenience of bicycling, such as bike share, uh, either docked or dockless, launch the development of a year-round maintenance and operations plan for MassDOT-owned bikeways, talking about a winter maintenance uh, pilot program mm -hmm. where we uh, 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 actually maintain sidewalks or shared-use paths in an area. We'll be uh, looking into that further as winter comes along. And also uh, initiative six, uh, making a deep dive into data collection and evaluation to inform all the other, other initiatives. We've already started one pilot project uh, counting bicycles and pedestrians on the Longfellow Bridge in Boston because it just got rehabbed over the past year. So we're uh, deep in that study too and hopefully we'll have some findings. Uh, the public outreach was one of my favorite parts of the entire plan. Uh, does anyone remember the uh, uh, Connecticut River uh, rolling stroll that happened two years ago? That was one of our first no. public events, and I, I think some of you were here. Laura was definitely with me helping out. Uh, it was a gray, overcast, not a particularly nice mm -hmm. day, and we did our own bit of tactical urbanism and got over 2,000 attendees mm -hmm. uh, on the Route 116 bridge over the Connecticut River between Holyoke and South Hadley, and that's where we started our public input where we had surveys where people could put dots in right in person. Uh, besides that, we also did the same for online. 
uh, where people uh, could uh, tell us what they liked about biking, what they didn't like about, what they wanted to see in their communities. We also had a wiki map that people could put in improvements. We had over mm -hmm. 3,000 individual comments on the wiki map alone. So a huge success. Uh, also, social media, too, uh, tweeting out to the polls that got tons more people than we would ever get if we just had, say, a half dozen public meetings around the state. I was completely sold on Twitter after this because we just reached probably 10 to 20 times more people than we ever would have through the regular conventional means. Uh, we also had regular listening sessions all around the state um, talking to different groups. Um, one of them uh, was up in uh, North Adams talking to people who have rural concerns about biking. Right. Uh, we interviewed youth in Revere, rural small town residents, women cyclists, residents of low income communities, um, people with disabilities, all out adventures in Hadley. We had a tremendous afternoon with them um, just because we want, want uh, biking to be an enjoyable and useful experience to people of all ages and abilities too. So. A lot of, uh, lot of different uh, outreach went into this, and all of this is located online and within the plans, um, all of our public outreach results. Um, here's the, the wiki map, frequency of needs improvement comments on the online map. Uh, not surprisingly, a lot of it focused around Boston, but it also, uh, uh, and the Pioneer Valley yes. too, a lot of comments there too for improvements, but also places that we weren't expecting, places like Taunton, which uh, is not even on our radar, but now is as far as making bike improvements go. So definitely uh, was valuable is, input Is there. that Route 23 going off from Springfield to the left? I'm not quite sure. Route 20 it looks like. 20? Yeah. 20. Probably They're close together. There's a point. lot related, sort of Westfield. And of course, like we're all gathered here today under the guise of health and wellness. Um, I don't have to sell anyone in this room on the benefits <laughs> of cycling. In Massachusetts, 55% of adults get the recommended 150 minutes of aerobic physical activity a week. Biking for just 30 minutes per day has many benefits, including uh, reduced risk for chronic disease, emotional well-being. I show up to work every day in a good mood because of it. Improved academic performance for children, what we were talking about earlier with all the safe routes to school kids and uh, getting driven there by their parents, missing out on a huge opportunity to get some exercise to and from school and a delayed onset of cognitive decline in older adults. Um, the healthy transportation compact is also something that was uh, has long been established at MassDOT, I think in 2013. Uh, it's an interagency initiative to achieve positive health outcomes through the coordination of land use, transportation, public health policy between MassDOT, DPH, and the uh, EOEEA. We all participate, and uh, going forward, <laughs> almost every MassDOT project that's not in a tunnel or on an interstate highway has a healthy transportation uh, compact piece Good. built into it where we have to account for safe walking and bicycling. Um, they further the goals of the healthy transportation compact by ensuring MassDOT project can include walking, biking, and transit where available. Um, a quick overview on the uh, potential demand for biking. We didn't have an objective understanding of where people bike today, so existing count data was very limited and inconsistent. Data on where people bike today only tells part of the story. Most people would bike if they felt safe and comfortable. This is confirmed in national research mm -hmm. and surveys in the uh, plan outreach. So we decided to focus our methodology on four pieces, where bikeable trips generally occur using a statewide travel demand model, where transit is nearby, where crashes are nearby using the MassDOT crash portal, and most importantly, where environmental justice populations reside uh, using US census statistics. So we basically took all of these uh, data layers and overlaid them on top of each other with MassDOT roadway infrastructure. And that's pretty much how we came up with our methodology of places to prioritize uh, as far as bicycle projects go. Um, I should add that most of the stuff in the bicycle and pedestrian plans is infrastructure on MassDOT roadways. MassDOT's also working on a shared use path planning and design guide that's gonna come out sometime next year. So think of these uh, three plans as all complementing one another. The shared use path uh, planning and design guide 
it, uh, guide is going to highlight even more uh, better ways to uh, build shared use paths. Uh, look at the bicycle and pedestrian plans as uh, that uh, companion piece of putting things on state roads and local roadways to get to these shared use paths and trails where we can have a more consistent network. Uh, here's the, what we, uh, the term we coined, the potential for everyday biking. It shows where to implement bicycle infrastructure to best match where short trips are made today and where there is the greatest need for infrastructure. Uh, not surprisingly, the whole state, it reads more like a population map. Mm -hmm. This is where the bulk of the people are. Dark blue is the highest potential for everyday biking. You see Springfield, uh, Westfield, Holyoke, Northampton, all in this part of the state, prominently in blue and green. Uh, green is uh, a little bit less. And the remaining 87% of the land in tan is uh, the rest of the state where not the huge population centers reside, but still things that we want to uh, look at. Uh, uh, this is the actual roadway. If you look there, there are uh, some definite state roadways in this area that we're looking to implement projects. I'm thinking Route 33 in Chicopee, Route 5 in West Springfield, Route 20 in Westfield, um, Route 116 through South Hadley. Uh, these are all state roadways that uh, we uh, overlaid all of the layers and analysis and came up where places where bicycle infrastructure is definitely lacking and that would be relatively uh, straightforward to implement. So we're looking at all those roads. Uh, perfect example, Route 20 in Westfield right here. Lack of continuous sidewalks, no bike facilities. Uh, it's on an existing PVTA transit route. Uh, many destinations along the corridor that would be very easily reachable by bicycle and a lot of mixed land uses. So that's, this is uh, one of our perfect poster child uh, projects that we're looking to implement. Also, just about a quarter mile down the road is the future Columbia Greenway in downtown mm -hmm. Westfield right. that it can connect up to. So we're thinking about all those connections as we're going through on all of our state roadways. That's just one example. Uh, this is another uh, safety example of high crash locations. Uh, this is in downtown Lowell, but it could very well easily be in Springfield at the base of the North End Bridge or the Memorial Bridge. Uh, uh, bridges, uh, obviously, are high volume areas for all modes of traffic, whether you're in a car, on a bike, or walking, and uh, for that reason, the conflicts escalate as far as uh, uh, crashes and accidents. Uh, there are plenty of gaps, too, that could be filled with existing roadway. Here's a good example out in Cape Cod and Barnstable, right by the Hyannis Airport, where we're looking to do uh, upgrades as well. Um, there's. Uh, a close-up picture of it as well. So, like I said earlier, the capital investment plan is going to allow us $60 million worth of investments of high priority projects over the next four or five years. That's pretty amazing. Um, and it is a lot of money, but not as much as you would think uh, when you try and divide, say, $15 million a year over a bunch of projects over four years. Uh, but we also have all these other great funding programs. Well, we talked about the Municipal Complete Streets funding programs that uh, has definitely been one of MassDOT's most successful projects uh, since we rolled it out four years ago. I'm thinking right off the top of my head, all the great projects in the area. Springfield, um, I'm a, I was on my way to some in-laws for Thanksgiving dinner last year on Bradley Road, and there are bike lanes there. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, when did those go in? And I think Jeff said that was part of the Complete Streets yes. funding program in Springfield. And I'm like, fantastic. And we're anxiously awaiting. Yeah. The results of the next round. Right. And besides <laughs> besides Springfield, there have also been uh, Agawam, where I grew up. They're going to be doing O'Brien's Corner, uh, which uh, I rode on Springfield Street as a kid growing up all the time. Definitely looking forward to some improved bicycle infrastructure there. Uh, West Springfield as well. Uh, Long Meadow, too, is a recent recipient of uh, Complete Streets funding. Uh, safe Routes to School. Uh, also, uh, Agua Middle School, where uh, I am uh, an alum of, is set to get some uh, big uh, Safe Routes to School funding as part of its upgrade 
Um, the Shared Use Path Program is also a separate initiative, which is just Shared Use Paths. That's $180 million currently in the capital investment plan. Um, Chapter 90 funding that all the municipalities are in charge of. Um, uh, regular roadway and bridge, bridge projects that I talked about earlier with the healthy transportation policy, uh, building in biking and walking. I wanted to save the Mass Trails grants for last because we just announced our first round of Mass Trails grants yesterday. I know there's a few people in the room that uh, applied to them, and uh, out of the 124 uh, projects that were submitted uh, over this past winter and spring, we uh, managed to fund 71 of them throughout the entire state, $5 million worth of funding, and uh, a couple big ones right here in Springfield. Uh, we managed to uh, give uh, a fair amount of money for design of the McKnight Trail that is on the Mass Ave. Mm -hmm. So we're very happy about advancing that, and also some funding up in Forest Park for a new trail and path around Porter Lake. So pretty happy about that. Uh, also, Great Barrington got some funding money in this part of the state, Good. which we're happy about. Yes. Um, and the, the, the great thing is that if, if you uh, applied and did not get it, our, our next round opens, I think, November 1st. Mm -hmm. And uh, we plan to have, hopefully, another $5 million worth of trails funding. <laughs> I will say that the big winner uh, for all 71 projects, uh, seven projects touched this one trail. Uh, in the state. Can anyone take a guess of what that trail is? Central Mass. Central. Mass, Central. Mass Central Rail Trail. Uh, a huge endeavor that MassDOT is really active and advancing. For those of you that are not familiar with it, it's the old railroad corridor between Boston and Northampton, uh, which is what the Norwatic Rail Trail currently through Northampton and Hadley is part of. But uh, we're actively building out the rest of it, uh, heading from east to west, uh, Cambridge, Somerville, Belmont, Waltham, Holden, Hardwick, and Ware, all towns where the Mass Central Rail Corridor passes through that all receive funding to advance their portions of the trail. So it's something that we're really excited about. I know that uh, I've heard it from at least a couple people today who said, in my lifetime, I want to see that whole 104 miles built. And uh, I'm, I'm going to do my darndest to make it happen. Um, you know, uh, Governor Baker is behind the whole Mass Trails grants. He was, uh, he was the one that two years ago said uh, to his cabinet, look, uh, MassDOT, DCR, and EEA are the three biggest trail builders in the entire state. Why aren't they all working together mm -hmm. to combine their resources? And uh, so from that day on, we have been, and uh, we've been producing some, some uh, uh, great ideas for uh, present and future trails projects. Uh, our big one that uh, is funded with the Gateway Cities Parks program is the Northern Strand Trail, which uh, is uh, uh, along the North Shore, just outside of Boston. It's going to be going through Everett, Malden, Revere, Saugus, and Lynn, and uh, with a bike shed of probably a quarter million people just within those five towns, so pretty great. Um, we're also measuring performance. You hear that uh, term being used all the time. When performance is measured, performance improves. We're taking that to heart. Um, each performance measure has a corresponding equity check, too. Uh, equity check is a way of identifying any disparities that affect certain populations, such as environmental justice communities. And it's all, uh, all of our performance measures will be coming out in Tracker, which is MassDOT's performance report that we come out every year, which you can also view online. Uh, a couple slides about the Complete Streets program, even though we went over it earlier. Uh, again, 92% of the roadways in Massachusetts are under municipal jurisdiction, which is why we thought it imperative to have both guides for walkability and bikeability to help our partner agencies. Uh, the Complete Streets funding program, um, this is uh, Tier 1, Tier 2, and Tier 3. Uh, again, all this uh, additional info is on the website. Uh, along with all of the maps uh, and all of the towns that have registered, have their approval policies, and approved projects now. Uh, the whole Complete Streets program is about three or four years old now. And we're finally starting to see some finished projects all across the state, such as ones in Dalton, Littleton, Framingham, and like I said, right here in Springfield even. Um, Lynn, Natick, Taunton, 
and on and on and on it goes. So oh, I know that I've thrown a ton of info at you guys, uh, but uh, it, it just speaks volumes to the fact that we are doing a lot of stuff at Mass.Now to further uh, bicycling and walking. Uh, like uh, the secretary says, we want to give people options. And we're at a really good time right now where we're actually getting a lot of funding and a lot of support from the governor all the way down. Um, so it's, uh, it's, it, it's, it's, it's almost daunting for me as the statewide bicycle and pedestrian coordinator to try and keep track of everything going on, which is why it's great to have district bike and ped coordinators like Laura in all six districts. Uh, so uh, with that, uh, do you want me to hold questions to the end and have Jeff go first? Yeah, I want to I wanna put one slide up just to okay. go. And it's quite obvious that you have so much information here. I'm really glad that you had the cold brew because <laughs> you flew through it. Right. Um, this slide I just want to put back up here because this is amazing. I, we caught this graphic on the first um, summit day the other day of just how many municipalities and communities are you know, registered as complete streets? Yeah, like two thirds of the entire state. Yeah, we read this time, it's 230 yeah. out of 351. Um, and how long has the Complete Streets program been around? Four years. Amazing. Yeah. So I want to say that this is happening. Um, and again, I want to get back to the point of we hear a lot about being Boston centric and a lot of stuff we do in Massachusetts, but because we're statewide, put this map in your mind. Pete's working all across the state. And it's impressive. Yeah. So I thank you. Yeah. Uh, I just want to leave this one up. Um, can I will make one comment. What we found now is the complete, overall the complete streets funding. You're only going to get it. A given community is only going to get it at most maybe every four years, just because they are spreading the money around. And so we're really having to look at how do we use, how do we get our DPW to look at more of its to do complete streets when it's doing its regular chapter 90 yeah. type money, mm -hmm. right. the money it gets yeah. every year for <clears throat> yeah. repavings. And so every time they're doing a repaving, how are they restriping it so that it reflects complete streets? Mm -hmm. Because that's over time where we're gonna finally actually, we're not gonna get our prioritization plan. It'll be, again, by the time I'm dead that it ever the first five years is ever even completed, unless we really look at all other strategies and to we get have, it worked we, and, out. And we have the same issues at the statewide level too. I mean, a great example of a routine maintenance project where we got to put in some great bicycle infrastructure was just in Chicopee, up on Route 116 over the past year, where uh, a lot of, I've gotten a lot of feedback from people saying, thank you for putting in right. those bike lanes where there never were before. Well, and and we, that was just the result of a routine paving project. So any opportunity where MassDOT sees, um, we'd like to uh, do that and uh, well, make we're it. Doing, we're uh, pushing for that on St. James, when they right. have to rebuild the bridge on St. James over 291 right now. Yep. Yep. And initially they were, and we have to thank Mass Bike for in the project review process, uh, Mr. French really helped bring up that, oh, you're rebuilding this bridge and you're not putting any bike lanes or sidewalks on yep. this bridge. Well, Tom and back. Oh, yeah, you are. Good. Yeah, really good there, I appreciate that. And, and connecting Mass Bike's role is to do that, is to find these bigger pictures and connect to the local advocates. So yeah. it wasn't just Tom, he alerted Todd, who really jumped in and, and jumped yeah. on it. Oh, yeah. And it's not just Springfield either, it's oh, the entire different. state. We live in a very old state where we're in a perpetual state of maintenance now. And that's that's our reality, unfortunately. Yeah, just a few more. I know, David, you want to jump in real quick? Yeah, so the hidden power of MassDOT's Complete Streets program is that any community that's joined the program and gotten funding 
they had to adopt a complete streets policy that doesn't only apply to the projects that get funded through the program, oh. it applies to everything. Oh, yeah. So feel free to point out to Public Works that if they're not doing complete streets on other projects when they have the opportunity to, they are not complying <laughs> with their own policy. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks right. Dave, that's really good. Yeah, one more and then we'll get to Marvin. One second, have, we'll get to you. I have two projects for Pete. They fit right into his priorities and they're already the uh, DOT priorities. One is maintenance, basic maintenance of the South End Bridge. That's a, a mass dot project. Mm -hmm. And we have managed to get a connection with our counterparts in Agawam. They're cleaning up their end. Our DPW has been really good. We're having to go on the sidewalks until we can get something better mm -hmm. as a connection with the Connecticut River Walk and Bikeway. Right. But we haven't had very good cooperation from MassDOT about sweeping the sidewalks and about picking up debris from fender benders. Mm -hmm. Secondly, on the North End Bridge, um, that is perfect for connecting to the already existing improvements on the West Springfield side of the river but the roadway is like oh this. Oh my God, it is. <laughs> <laughs> not, and, not bike friendly. And the no. sidewalk, the cement on the sidewalk is spalling, it's dangerous, mm -hmm. and that's a mass dot responsibility. We hope that you can give that priority because that will expand everyday biking and walking opportunities with the Connecticut River right. Walking Bike <clears throat> and the existing infrastructure on the west side. Really noted, thank you. <laughs> Cole, one last from Marvin, then we'll move on. Yep. I just wanted to talk to you about the maintenance DCR is responsible for a lot of the off-road path, uh, paths in this area, mm -hmm. and they are not willing to do anything about cleaning them up so they can be used in the winter. And there are people who commute to Amherst from Northampton right. on a daily basis, mm -hmm. and they are confined to using transit or cars mm. in the winter. Okay. And they complain about it constantly. I think with DCR it might be an issue of resources. They're just so understaffed. That, That's correct. You know, but it's, DOT it's, may have a, a commitment or make a commitment to cooperate to provide those resources. That could be a very good pilot project for the snow maintenance in the winter. Right. So. That's what I'm suggesting. Yeah. Okay. Very good. <laughs> Duly noted. And, Duly noted. and the, uh, the the creation of the trails team allows that conversation to really take Definitely. hold. Yeah. The fact that uh, the DCR and the DOT and the EA all get together every other week. Um, you can say, hey, DCR, we know you can't do it, but maybe DOT can find some funding or have a piece of equipment or something along those lines to really make it. That and when anything gets done, say thank you. Yes, area. yes, right. hands down. Um, great, thanks. Okay, right. we're going to do one more. We're running a little slow, but I hope we're going to catch it up. But the idea here is to do one more presentation, um, do a quick break, and then we're going to have a presentation during lunch, which has arrived. But don't worry, it's soup, it's cold yes. soup. Um, <laughs> gazpacho, we figure gazpacho for, uh, so the reason I'm telling you now is so that Jeff hurries through because he's just what's standing between you and lunch. No, I'm just kidding. Um, uh, so uh, I know, I've got lunch on one side and that fantastic presentation. Thanks so much for all your hard work. The entire effort we do for it. Yeah. Seriously. Address the fresh air from the friends. Yeah. Mm. And, uh, and, and so, you know, Some of this is he's got the big picture in mind, and, and we're going to bring you down now. We're going to bring you all the way down to the local level uh, because we all know that's really what matters. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, uh, so, so I'm here to talk about local bikeway networks and how, as a planner, I'm a transportation planner with the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission, and my colleagues are here today, Becky and Catherine. And we have other planners here that have worked in similar capacities in the past. I think in the Pioneer Valley region alone, we probably have like six communities, maybe seven. I was trying to count in my head that have done local bikeway networks, including Springfield. And, um, and uh, they're all different. Uh, this is actually a, a slide out of the community, re the bike resource guide mm -hmm. that, um, that is, is part of um, MassDOT's effort. And it's a great resource. And I really relied a lot on it when I was doing this presentation and when we've done planning in the past. So if you haven't looked at that resource guide, go there. It's just packed full of great information that's all relevant. It's and, a very easy read, right. too. And in many ways, it's timeless. I love the aspect that it didn't nail itself down to specific details of the design. The, um, so it's just a click on any button, right? Yep. Probably the arrow is the best. Yeah. Right arrow, maybe. So why create a bikeway network? Um, I'm not going to go through all these because of the cold soup, but there's, there's really, really good reasons to do a bikeway network. 
Um, we talked about this one here that, about projects that are going on and, and then you'd like to get your projects in them. If you have a bikeway network plan, something that shows what you had envisioned happening in your community, when the city's ready to repave a road, you can go to it and say, look, this is our network plan. We already said this is what we wanted to see, a bike lane on this road. It's not something that we called you up today because we saw the pavement trucks out there. This is something we've thought through. And, and I know that's something that Springfield has been working really hard on, and the roads are getting resurfaced that these priorities that come to mind. Um, and when you have a two-year plan, oddly enough, a two-year pavement management plan, it's even better. You're 90% more likely to get those bike lanes in. Um, these, this network is a great advocacy tool. It's a great way to engage advocates. They can see something. They get a sense of like what's been done, what are we going to be doing in the future, and get excited about it. Uh, when you go for funding, you guys are really lucky that Pete brought all this money for Mass Trails. And, and part of that was because your projects that you submitted were part of a network. They were something that you had thought through. And that makes you far more competitive in the big picture. Um, it's great for politicians. You can say, you know, this is what our network is now, and here's what it really could be. Look how exciting this is. So you can engage the politicians on that level. And with developers, when you can come and talk to a developer that's putting in something and say, listen, this isn't just something we think is a good idea. This has been through a public process. It's been vetted to our communities, and this is what we want. That carries a lot more weight with developers when, when they're talking about you know, the trade-offs of what we can do and what we can't do. And I think you saw that with the uh, casino. When Springfield Casino came in, you already had identified routes around uh, the, casinos in Springfield that, the casino in Springfield that you wanted to see bike lanes on. So it's a great tool and um, really worth doing. So there are six principles that Federal Highway and MassDOT have adopted in creating a bike lane network. And they're all pretty um, you know, rational. Cohesion, safety, access. Uh, but as planners, we really go beyond that and we look at the community because we want this to be a community plan, one that uh, has a lot of local buy-in and investment. So when we talk about what's important in the plan, the most important thing is the public outreach, the great work that B does and Benjamin does to get the public involved and at the table talking about well, what's important, what really matters to you. And the plan really should be shaped around those priorities. I can't emphasize that enough. It's probably the place where most plans fall short. And I think it's for good reason. It's expensive, it takes a lot of time, there's so many barriers to engage people at different levels, but it's worth doing. This is where you want to make your effort. And don't rush it. Um, if you need to you know, spend some more time and delay that draft report, it's, it's worth doing. And then talk about engaging people at different levels. I know when Springfield was doing their network plan the first time, uh, Mass Bike came out and said, hey, why don't we take your city engineer and your city planner to Boston? There's a lot of new things going on in Boston, and we'll walk them around with an engineer that knows their, that speaks the same language as they do, and talk about what were the challenges, how did you handle drainage here, how did it impact the delays at your traffic signals when you had a green bike box there? And so, David, you were part of this. And uh, it was a great opportunity to have them um, start speaking the same language and, have, uh, and start a dialogue that we really didn't have before that. And that dialogue is really, in creating a bicycle uh, network plan, is a visual dialogue. And it can at times be a very confusing dialogue. And that's what you want to avoid. So when you're doing your outreach and engaging people, it's great to have strong visuals. And I love the ones that you had, they just just jump out of what you're talking about. Because things like a separated bike lane, or people will say protected bike lane, or a cycle track, you know, when elected officials start hearing all this stuff, they can really, their eyes will glaze over, and, <laughs> and you know, it's like, what are they talking about? So, uh, you know, you need to have the terminology down, but you need to have it in a visual format. Uh, in the outreach, you know, we talk about what are priorities. These are the priorities from the Northampton outreach. So, um, when the Northampton did their bike and ped plan, the community uh, had, you know, connectivity was a big deal for them. But that's not always the case. I know um, the, uh, for many of our communities, it's, it's been, there's been other issues. I know when we were doing South Hadley, they said, you know, we really just, we don't have an abandoned rail corridor. We're not going to build a bike path like that, but that's what we want. 
um, we're missing that in identity, and they said, what can we do to provide a facility that would be similar, that would offer you know, um, a place to go and away from traffic where we feel our community members would be safe. And so we really customized that plan around what they needed. And um, this is a slide you've probably seen, you may have seen in the past. It's probably one that's been, in many ways, revolutionary to the bicycle planning industry. Um, the fact that we know that there's a large section of the population that just doesn't want to deal with traffic, that they're looking for a low stress environment. And when Pete talks about those everyday bicycling trips and the short trips, this is the population that has the huge potential for us that for the most part, we haven't been able to capture with our traditional planning. Um, when I started doing this 20 years ago, it would have been, oh, you know, you should ride on the road. If you don't feel comfortable riding on the road, there's something wrong with you. And uh, you, you need to take another class. But we know that's not the case. And if we can build facilities that appeal to this, this broader group of uh, population, then we can really make a huge difference. And here's the tricky um, I know you uh, chart that I love to show, and, and you yeah, gotta yeah. sometimes spend some time looking at this. I know we don't have a lot of time. But look at that 6,000 right here. It's like, 6,000 is really a key point for us in LFA. And uh, if you've got a volume over 6,000, uh, you're in trouble as far as using, getting people out on the road, unless you can separate them from the traffic. And so it's really where, and then if you look at speed, is the other part of this thing. And once you get up around 25, 30 miles an hour, you go beyond that, people just don't feel comfortable riding the road. Um, at least, and especially not with their family members. Mm -hmm. And so we've got this really narrow area to work in, and, and this, this guidance really came out of the Separate Bikeway Design Guide that MassDOT had worked on. I was just at a workshop in New Haven, and this is being adopted by AASHTO. So this is going, and that's a very conservative design, you know, engineering uh, aspect of our field. And they're now adopting basically entire separate bike way design guide is going mainstream. And that's gonna be revolutionary for us. So some of the tools that we do is, as data plan, as, as planners is to gather data, and we're really good at this. Um, and we use, I know, a heat map. This is one of the tools where these red areas that are really highlighted here mm -hmm. are, are areas that would have a combination of high trip attractors and populations. So we know those short trips that we're trying to track, they're all right in those areas. And they're really easy to get if you could make a comfortable place for people to ride. Another tool that's, I know, it's highlighted in the resource guide that, that Pete worked on is MAPC's local access score tool. You can use this now, it's online. You can pick up any road segment that you want and find out what's the likelihood of generating bicycle trips on this road. So we throw that data into the mix. Um, we look at the regional linkages. So what are your connections to the communities around you? Are you part of a, a larger network? And how can you make those connections work for you? The, uh, we look at data on traffic volume. So traffic volume is really critical. Remember we said if you're over 6,000 vehicles, right? things are, you gotta come up with a better solution. And so you've gotta get this data. And fortunately, um, all the RPAs collect this data. So Franklin County collects it, Berkshire, Pioneer Valley, and we upload this to MassDOT's MS2 website. So you can go there and get this data. And then you can supplement it. You can ask the Planning Commission uh, for free counts every year. We do a few free counts for every community. And you can also go and look at developers' plans because when you're doing you do uh, like a new grocery store or a CBS or gas station, as part of your traffic study, you'll do an analysis of what the volume is of traffic by that facility, and, and so you can gather more of those counts. And uh, but it's a really useful tool to have, and it may seem like intimidating to collect that data, but it's really not that hard. And um, so, in the end, with all this data, we throw it into this, you know formula and outspits the level of stress for these roads. So these blue roads that you see here, these are really comfortable roads. And so an 11 year old would feel comfortable riding on that road. Um, and seniors would feel comfortable riding on those roads. Families would feel comfortable on those roads. But you can see there's a problem. 
if, if I've got this neighborhood uh, right down here, I think it's the Merrick neighborhood. This is in West Springfield, so just across the river from us. Uh, you could bike all around this neighborhood and you're just fine. But you're, tr you're sort of trapped. This These are the arterials and collectors that are in red, sort of orange here. They, um, those are not low volume roads. Those are not low speed roads. So you've got to come up with a solution. And that's what the network plan really works to do. We want to get a, build a low stress network where we can track a large percent of, of riders. And so we, we work on different scenarios. Now you could look at this and there maybe you could build like a, a tunnel from this section right here to this one. <laughs> <laughs> sure you, know, you, could, uh, uh, you could change one of these arterials and you could do a separated bike lane on mm -hmm. one of those. Which is one. actually happening. Which actually, yeah, that's true. It's happening on this road. And I think a protected bike bridge mm -hmm. on this one. Mm -hmm. So they've already figured it out for us. But those are the challenges. <laughs> Basically, it's not something that's easy to do. It sometimes takes a lot of thought and money. Uh, but if you look at the projects and decide, well, which of these are local roads and which are federal aid roads, the federal aid roads, you're spending you know, larger um, tip resources for those projects. And sometimes these are very realistic as far as getting them done. And um, so I, I guess a few examples is in Northampton, they just took a stretch of the sidewalk and designated this for bicyclists, create their own separate bikeway, they call it cycle track. And uh, it works on, on a very, very busy road. It's one directional on each side. Mm -hmm. And then recently in, uh, in Amherst, they took a sidewalk and they had a road that was connecting to their bikeway network. And they were just like, what are we gonna do? This is carrying a lot of busy traffic during rush hour. And they widened out the sidewalk and turned it into a side path, mm -hmm. one that is, they just I also added uh, one of the bike share stations there as well. So there's options out there. Some of them aren't that expensive. It just requires some creative thought. Yeah. The, uh, oh, so this is South, South Hadley. This ended up being a network plan. It's kind of hard to show a network plan because it's so large. But I do have some of these in the back if you have a chance to look at them. And for South Hadley, so what did they really want? Remember, they wanted to get off road. So we found a section connecting two elementary school and the high school that also connected down to one of their other parks that we, where we create a separated bicycle facility and provide that recreational option that was for that community so important. And of course it would be different for every other community. But this, is a, um, this was a great project. In this case, we identified, instead of saying we wanted a cycle trial or you know, a separated bike lane, we just said we wanted low stress on certain roads but the idea that the engineering and design that would go into that would follow up in the later part. Um, so I guess the nice thing about a network plan, one that I think I'd want you to walk away with remembering is that the network plan really gives you an option to look at how some really small things can make a huge difference, small pieces, and that there's really not any insignificant pieces to the puzzle that you put together. So if you do a bike lane, put a tunnel or a side path, any of those projects in the end can make a huge difference in how the network's used and how people get around. And, uh, and that's it. So this is, uh, I think this is the Riverwalk in Springfield, and that's a tunnel that um, MassDOT recently constructed in Northampton under the active railroad. <coughs> yeah. But that's it. Yes. Well, and it's what Sheila was just mentioning. The network, it can be as little, it can be as simple things as getting the sidewalks on the on a bridge, uh, a street sweeping on a bridge. Yeah. Little things make amazingly huge difference. It never ceases to surprise me. We'll have a small section of a bike lane and, and people will just be ecstatic. But now I can get this one. So, um, yeah. Thanks so much. Thank you, Jeff. Cool. Yeah. Um, this is super great. I always like to think that, you know, a, a bike route, especially if you're thinking of low stress, it's only as good as your weakest link. You know, you can have a beautiful, we see this all the time in Boston, you have these gorgeous pathways, but then you have a crossing which has no facilities to it, and so that's the barrier. So I think really the power of what you're doing here is you're identifying these, and then you can hyper-focus to make the most impact as possible. So I think you're doing wonderful work, so thank you. Cool, get a chance to check out the maps in the back. Um, for timing purposes, we're gonna um, definitely, everybody stand up one more time, stretch yourselves out. Um, Tom, are we set for everything back there? We've got everything, I haven't done enough really. 
Okay. Um, we'll take two seconds to do that. I think there are bowls back there. So we have gazpacho um, for us. Grab a bowl um, and then sit back down. We're going to have a, a lunch um, showcase with Josh, who's here from the 413 Pike Life folks. And take a few minutes, stretch your legs, use the restroom, grab your soups, and then join right back in. We'll have a talk, and then we'll get to some of the whiteboards on the wall. But yeah, great. Thank you so much. Great. Great. See you in a minute. All right. I'm going to be out.